Hello and welcome along to Obsession Engineering and today I'm going to answer a question you've probably never asked but here we go anyway. What is the difference between a normal shock absorber and a twin tube shock absorber? Why is this better than this? So on the right hand side we have a generic Japanese fully adjustable rear shock. This one's actually out of a ZX-10, but that doesn't really make any difference. So, we've got compression adjusters at the top, a rebound adjuster at the bottom, we've got a spring preload adjustment around here, and it's a perfectly good shock. Unless you're at the front of some sort of race championship, this shock will do everything you need to do. So why have posh end race teams and even some manufacturers now for road bikes started using fancy twin tube shocks. They're more expensive, they might just look bling, but there is actually a reason why this, in theory, is better than this. But to find out why, we need to take them apart. So here is the important bit that I stripped earlier out of actually an SP100 shock, but the basics are the same. And the giveaway between a twin tube and a normal shock is where your rebound adjuster is. On these, the rebound adjuster is at the bottom of the shock. And that's quite important, because if you look at the top end of this shock, at the top of the shaft, we have this little pin sticking out. And that is the top of a needle. So, to explain a bit more, this is the bottom of the shock that bolts into the swing and arm linkage. Then you have the shaft here, some seals and bushes, and then the important bit that does the work, which is a piston and some shim stacks. And if you can see underneath the uh, shim stacks, there are holes that go all the way through this piston. So, as the piston goes up and down in the shock body, oil is pushed through the piston and it pushes the shims out of place, it sort of bends them out of the way, so that oil can pass through the piston and that gives you your damping. It makes it sort of relatively difficult for the piston to go up and down and it controls how much oil is passing through the piston. So that's the basics of it. But what you'll notice under here is this little hole. Now this little hole corresponds to this little needle. And at the moment I have it on its most open setting. So at the moment oil can actually go down the sides of this needle, through past the piston, and out of this little bypass hole. And that's all it is, is a little bypass hole. So, if I were to close this adjuster into its hardest setting, it winds the pin up, up the inside of here, and this needle would actually block the hole in the top of the piston, in the top of the shaft, and that would stop oil going through the bypass, and then all the oil would have to go through the shim stacks, which makes the action of the shock harder. Hopefully, that makes sense. So, using my screwdriver, I'm just going to demonstrate. If I close that, you should see the needle, if I can get it in focus, actually sticking out the top of the uh, shaft a little bit more. See, there it goes. It's not a big movement, but that is there all the way round in, so that's blocking off the bypass hole. So therefore, all of the oil, when the piston moves up and down, has to go through the holes in the piston and push the shims out of the way. And obviously the shims are harder to push out of the way than just flowing oil through a hole, so that gives you more damping. So you might be thinking at this point, this hole here is only connected to the rebound adjuster. But surely, the oil will flow both ways through this bypass hole. And there, you have an important point. Because the shock at the top has a compression adjuster. It actually has two, a low speed and high speed. But if the rebound adjuster has affected the compression damping as well, why do we need another compression damper? Well, the compression damping won't be as affected by this hole, purely because of the way the oil flows, won't make as much difference on the compression damping with this hole open or closed. So the manufacturers have added an extra adjuster that will only affect the compression side. But there is a bit of a compromise, because the compression adjuster obviously only affects the compression damping on the shock. But the rebound adjuster affects the compression and the rebound. 
it affects the rebound damping more, but it does affect both. And that is the problem with a single piston shock. One of the first things we'll notice on this lovely TTX shock is there is no adjuster at the bottom. Both of the adjusters are at the top. And that's important because that means that there isn't a bypass hole in this shaft. So how are we getting the piston and the shim arrangement to work? There's only one way to find out, and that's to take it apart. So you may have to bear with me a second while I get some tools out. Stage one is to pop the shock in the spring compressor. So what we've got is just a hydraulic jack down the bottom and this pushes the shock up and the plate at the top stops the uh, spring getting pushed up. So it compresses the spring and then under here is just a circlip we can remove and that allows everything to come out the top of the spring compressor, leaving the spring behind. Nice and simple. So now with the circlip removed and the tension removed from the spring, all I do is remove that and the spring slides straight off the shock. Nice and easy if you have the correct tools. The next step in stripping the shock is to release the gas pressure out of this cylinder. So I'll undo this little screw here and behind there there's a little rubber block through which I'll poke my needle and that'll release the pressure of the nitrogen. With the gas pressure released it's allowed me to be able to just push the end of the uh, reservoir in so that I can get to this little circlip and now that I can get to that circlip I can then actually pop that out and remove this end plate for the gas reservoir and that will allow me access to the floating piston that sits in here and separates the oil from the gas. In there you can see the nice shiny floating piston. Now the reason it needs one of those is to separate the oil from the gas because when the shaft goes up obviously it displaces a quantity of oil in the shock and the oil has to go somewhere so it goes into this reservoir. So the floating piston just moves forwards and backwards a bit. And in fact, if I move the shock up and down, it'd be even better if the camera stayed in focus, you can just see the floating piston just moving just a few millimetres. And that's all it takes to compensate for the fluid transmitted when the uh, shaft goes into the shock. Now that I've got the gas pressure released, the oil is no longer pressurised inside the shock. So what I'm going to do is take the piston assembly out of the other end of the shock. So what I've done here is we've got a bump stop, then we've got this end cap that just, you know, keeps the weather and the horribleness out of the rest of the shock. Then we have this plate here which screws into the shock body and holds all the seal head in place. So I'm just going to unscrew that and then I can extract the piston. So with the seal head now unscrewed, what I can do is gently give that a bit of a wiggle. And that should pop out of there with the piston assembly on it. So now with a bit of wiggling I now have the piston assembly with the inner tube attached to it and this is the outer tube, hence the term twin tube. Tube 1, tube 2. Now that I've got both piston assemblies on the bench you can see some distinct differences. This is the old conventional style piston assembly and as you can see we've got two sets of shim stacks on a piston that push the oil forward and backwards. But on the twin tube arrangement, the piston is just solid. It has a bit of a piston ring there to seal inside the tube, and it's got a top out spring. Other than that, it's fairly simple. So, this fits over the piston assembly, something like that. Slightly awkward one handed, but there you go. So that sits in there. And this attaches into the shock body and is held in place. So what will happen is as the piston goes up the shaft on the compression stroke, it will push oil through that big hole at the bottom there that you can see if my camera focuses properly. And that pushes it through the shock body down here and through the compression stack because there's a uh, piston assembly with shims on it in here. Then when the piston goes the other way on rebound it pushes the oil along here out of these holes along the outer between the two tubes and down the other two little holes you can see at the back over there which again travels through a drilling in the shock body and goes through the rebound stack. Relatively simple. There's also a non-return valve 
uh, that sort of opens on each one so that when the shock goes the other way, it just pulls oil through with no restriction. So hopefully that explains most of the difference. To make it even easier, I'll just whip these out next and show you the shim stacks. The first bit you'll notice inside the uh, adjuster cap is two ball bearings and a load of holes and some little springs. And as the uh, ball bearings run into the little holes, that's what gives you your clicks. So what we have here is the rebound piston and shim stack. There's a spring and a check plate so that when the oil is flowing in compression, it can be pulled back through these big holes and disappears with no resistance. Then when we get oil flowing towards the rebound stack, the non-return valve closes and oil is forced through the piston and under these shims that sort of bend open and gives us our damping properties. So obviously the faster the shock moves, the more the shims are pushed out of place and that's how much damping you get. What you can also see here is this little hole and the adjuster here, a little bit like on the conventional shock, that just opens a bypass that goes through the middle of the piston and that gives you your click adjustment to adjust how much or how little oil is flow through the shim stack. So hopefully that explains how that works. So just to recap the whole lot together, if in rebound the piston will pull down this inner tube, forcing oil through the gap here and up between the two tubes in the shock body. It'll then come through this little hole at the bottom here and that will then push the oil into the holes in the bottom of that piston assembly or through the bypass hole in the middle. So if the adjuster here, the rebound adjuster is closed, that bypass hole will be closed and all the oil flows up here, pushes the shims out of the way and gives you your damping. If the adjuster is more open, more oil flows through the bypass and you get in effect less damping so the shock is softer. So the real advantage of a TTX is your rebound and your compression are completely separate. On the road, probably not really necessary. When you're racing, it's a real benefit. So that is the idea of how a twin tube shock is better than a conventional shock. So there you have it. The real advantage to a twin tube shock is complete separation of your compression and rebound damping circuits. It is on track a definite advantage. On the road, probably not really necessary but it is quite nice to have. All I've got to do now is put it all back together again. Thanks for watching and join me again next time for more motorbike fun.